Um, this section is going to be on uh, the spanning tree protocol. You ever wonder when you connect up switches in your network that you see that it takes a, an extremely long time for your ports to initialize? Well, you can blame part of that on the spanning tree protocol and the election process that's necessary for um, switches to uh, coexist. Spanning tree basically uh, is a protocol that does two things for us. First of all, what spanning tree does is it allows us to connect switches in an environment uh, and prevent that environment from having what we call router uh, switching loops. Switching loops are when packets uh, are entered into a loop and there's more than one way to get from one path to another and they endlessly circle it within that loop. So we have to eliminate that process within our switch environments. The second thing that spanning tree does for us though is that uh, it allows for us to have redundancy. So there are many times you're going to want to take a switch and have multiple connections from one switch to another which would result in a, sw in a switching loop but in this case, what it's going to do is going to automatically open that connection for us and prevent that loop from happening. Now, if we have a failure somewhere along the line, the spanning tree protocol will go in and heal that connection and provide that redundant connection so that we're up back and running. So basically, that's what spanning tree does for us. It provides for um, redundancy while preventing us from having switching loops. All right? uh, basically, the concept of uh, the uh, algorithm for spanning tree is based off an election process. And the election process, basically what happens is that we have one switch that's going to be elected the root. So the term spanning tree comes from this idea that we are going to create this spanning tree that's going to have one path up all the way up through its root and, uh, and up through the trunk. So um, the term spanning tree basically means we can continue to span this tree, but it's going to ensure that we only have one path through this entire environment. Okay, so how does spanning tree work? Well, basically what's going to happen is when we initialize these switches, we are going to have an election process that occurs. And so you're going to start to see these the, um, switches and their, um, the port lights start to change colors. And as they're changing colors, basically what's happening is they're exchanging information about their, uh, their uh, spanning tree priority or their MAC address, which is going to be used to determine which one is the root switch. All right, so basically what happens is this. Out of the box, all of these switches basically will have the same spanning tree priority. If we, if we don't go in and do any type of configuration on them, they'll all have exactly the same spanning tree priority. So what happened is the switch that has the lowest MAC address would be elected to root. And all the other switches then will try to establish the closest, uh, shortest possible path back to that root switch. Now we can actually intercede because we don't want any switch to be necessarily our root switch. We don't want a switch in an access closet somewhere to be our root switch. So what we can do is we can actually go in and put in a spanning tree priority, assign a spanning tree priority to the switch that we want to be the root, so we're going to give it a lower priority than all the rest of them, and it will then become the root switch. It will go through a new election process, and it becomes the root switch. All right, so what we want to do with this is actually go in and experiment with how spanning tree works. And we can do this with Packet Tracer. So if you go to Packet Tracer and you pull out four similar switches. So we go and pull out four similar switches and we connect them. Well, how do we want to connect them? Well, why don't we just connect every switch to every other switch? Now we have tons of loops out here. We have all kinds of loops going to every switch, right? So how is spanning tree going to react to this? Well, when you connect all of these and make your connections, and remember we have to use the right type of connectors. We're going to use crossover cables between all of these connectors. You'll see the spanning tree algorithm um, in effect. You'll start to see the uh, port uh, status has changed, the lights change, and ultimately after about 45 seconds it will settle out. All right? When it settles down, it's, the election process has been completed. And what we'll end up with is one of these switches being elected as the root switch. And so if we looked at this switch situation, which one of these switches would be the root switch? Well, it looks like we have two good candidates, right? We have switch A and we have switch C, which would be good candidates for the root switch. Why? Because all of their switches are on. So it's a good chance that one of them two are the root switch. So how do we know which one is the root switch? Well, if we take a look at the connections to each of them, you can see that switch A is connected to switch B. Even though the port on A is, is on, you'll notice that the port on B is off. So we don't have a direct connection between A and B. Well, that's a good indication that this is not the root switch. So let's take a look at, 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 at uh, switch C. Take a look at switch C. Its connection from C to A is green on both sides. You'll see from C to B is green on both sides, and you'll see that C to D is green on both sides. Only one switch will have that circumstance. That has to be the root switch. 
Okay, and we could go in and actually change these. Let's say that we wanted switch A or switch B to be the root switch. Well, how would we do that? Well, what we'd have to do is go into, let's say, root uh, switch B, and we would have to actually go in and set the spanning tree priority. If we set the spanning tree priority so that it's lower than C, D, or A, an election process will occur, and now it will become the root switch. Okay, so what we want to do is challenge you to play with this. So go in and actually make different switches, the root switch, by changing its spanning tree priority. All right, uh, based on how you connect your switches, we don't really know which switch is going to be the root switch. So you should now be able to identify which switch is the root switch. And the last step is we want to see that spanning tree is actually working. So what if we go in and we make a disconnection? Right now, switch C is the root switch. But what happens if we go in and we disconnect this cable? Now, switch B no longer has a direct connection to switch C, but it needs to connect to switch C because it's the root. Well, you will see this network will automatically heal itself. Spanning tree election will occur again, and switch B will now either take a, connect, a path between B to D and to C, or from B to A and down to C. So what we want you to do is use Packet Tracer to go in and explore this and see how spanning tree actually works. Okay, um, the, um, the other thing that you can... Uh, try with this as well is we can add more switches to this. If we add more switches with additional loops, you will see that spanning tree will continue to ensure that we eliminate the loops, but yet we will still maintain that redundancy if needed if we have a break. So basically in this section on spanning tree, what we want to do is challenge you to um, interconnect switches and see if you can see spanning tree at work and understand the results of the elections and if, specifically if you can identify which switch has become the root switch. And that's basically an overview of how spanning tree works. Uh, my name is John Sands. I'm a uh, professor at Moraine Valley Community College, and I've been teaching the Cisco Network Academy courses for about 10 years. The three most important uh, issues when you're teaching spanning tree, first of all, uh, you need to emphasize what does spanning tree do. So you need to emphasize the whole concept of uh, switching loops and also you need to look at um, this concept of redundant networks and the ability for a network to heal itself. Um, the second thing I would, I would say you really want to emphasize when talking um, and, and demonstrating the spanning tree is see what effect the spanning tree have on the network. So students need to experiment with this to see um, you know, as you add new networks, as you change the cabling, what effect does spanning tree have on the network. And the third thing is I would emphasize is have students play with this. Have them start to recognize what happens when, spanning, when a spanning tree election occurs, and connect and disconnect cables. Have them experiment to see um, how the network responds and um, exactly uh, what the timing that, that are introduced and um, you know, what impact it would have. Uh, one other thing I'd probably mention, though, as you're, as you're talking about this, is that spanning tree really is critical that it's, it is configured on an actual production network so you don't end up with a root switch in a closet somewhere. So that might be something that you might also want to want to mention when talking about spanning tree. Most important uh, tools uh, in teaching spanning tree, first of all, I would think that the use of packet tracer just expands our capabilities. So we can build you know, large networks, large switch networks, and students can see the effect without each student having to have their own stack of equipment. But I would also take the time to bring students into an actual production network and let them see what it, what it looks like on the actual gear itself. And if you can, simulate it on, on actual um, gear could they, so they can see um, what impact it has on a real network. One caveat I would want to mention or note is that in real production networks, you are going to have VLANs. And it's important to understand that every VLAN has its own spanning tree, so things are going to be a little different, a little more complicated in them situations. This is a very intro, intro uh, level to spanning tree, so it's something you need to be aware of. And if you're using this lab on real equipment, you want to make sure that there are no VLANs on the switches themselves. And the, I would end this by saying what I would recommend for most teachers is use this as a time to experiment and see if, use this as also an evaluation tool. See if students can understand, you know, the, the five stages. Can they actually look at the port statuses and identify what stage are each of these ports in? See if they can time the process. 
go through and, and see how long it takes the spanning tree election process to occur. And then you know, might even take it a step further and turn off spanning tree and see what effect it has. Uh, you, you know, a lot of times we want to turn off spanning tree because that port has no possibility of being connected to another switch. So we want to disable it so that the host or whatever is connected to that device will come up quicker. All right? But we want to start to see real life applications of this. And, and you know, now that we have tools like uh, Packet Tracer, let them experiment with it. That's the way you really learn how this works, is to you know, try different experiments and, and actually um, have them report on what they find, what were their findings. Put some open-ended questions and, and uh, you know, go a little bit off the standard labs and let them experiment with this. Uh, probably one of the things I, when teaching spanning tree that I wish I would have um, recognized and uh, informed people was the impact of a switch that has uh, uh, multiple VLANs because this lab won't work if a switch has VLANs on it or it will work differently. So it's one of the um, things that I would warn teachers when they're, when they're working with this. Um, the other thing is, um, you, you know, as far as something I've, I've learned with this is that there this exercise really allows the students to walk into a network and to start to identify things before. And, and you know, as we see these ports flash and so on, they have a better concept of what's actually happening in the network just by walking in and observing uh, typical uh, switches in, in a uh, infrastructure environment.